I've just been really lucky to play people that I think are worth spending time with and that audiences have too. I feel like I'm drawn to projects where we are forced to see each other and to know that everybody is on their own hero's journey and has a story worth telling and deserves to be at the center of at least their own story. I'm Carrie Washington and this is the timeline of my career. My first IMDb credit is for, I believe, an ABC After School special. I played a very important supportive role as, I think, a cheerleader. <laughs> and actually, the thing I remember most about it is that that production was the job that got me my SAG card. So I was officially in the union, thanks to ABC. Little did I know that many years later I'd spend seven seasons on ABC doing all the things they tell you not to do in after school specials. <laughs> <laughs> At that point of my career, when I was doing the after school special, my parents were super supportive because it was really just a hobby and provided supplemental income. My mom really used my extracurricular acting as somewhat of a carrot that she dangled before the rabbit because I wasn't allowed to audition if my grades weren't up. It had to not interfere with my school. So I think she didn't mind me doing acting as an extracurricular activity. But later on, when I chose it as a career, she was devastated. It was not an easy decision to go to college, but I guess I kind of have always known that as much as I love acting, it's not the only thing I want to do in the world. And so I really wanted to have a liberal arts degree. I really wanted to give myself the opportunity to learn and grow and study for several years before becoming an actor. But I actually had a very pivotal audition in my career where I said to my agents at the time, if I get this job, then I will defer college. And if I don't get this job, then I'm going to go to college for four years. And I didn't get the job. It came down to me and one other actress. And it went to that actress, Tandy Newton. So thanks to Tandy, I have a college degree. Hey, I'm here for you. Your dad and I love you very much. I know. I love you too. So my first film was a really beautiful indie movie called Our Song. It actually got nominated for a Cassavetes Award at Indie Spirit Awards. It was a very low budget film, but I didn't know what how films were made. So, you know, our entire transpo department wasn't like a bunch of Teamsters and trucks. It was like four Metro cards. And sometimes my mom would drop us off <laughs> and all of the cast members at, at our various homes. But it was a really special movie. The director is Jim McKay, who I adore and I learned so much making that movie to be able to be in a film playing a real girl in a marching band in New York it was every day I felt like all of my dreams had come true and while I was making that movie I learned about Save the Last Dance and read the script and auditioned what's wrong with him he don't know you Kenny I'm his father he knows me what should I do come around more often see I can't talk to you and I can't depend on you. In a lot of ways, my character Chenille in Save the Last Dance was inspired by a lot of the real kids I was working with in Brooklyn filming our song because in order to film our song, we had to learn all of the routines and even be in parades. Like we really, I joined a marching band in Brooklyn to make that movie, but I was very, very close to a lot of the band members. They were my friends. And so Save the Last Dance and our song, those films will always be for me, very tied to each other. And I actually not, I wound up not being able to go to Sundance for our song because we were filming Save the Last Dance. So when I was a kid, I grew up in the Bronx in the same neighborhood as Jennifer Lopez. We both studied with an incredible teacher who was really like a teacher to me, but a mentor to her. Larry Maldonado became ill and had to not come to class for several weeks. And Jennifer substituted because she was one of the big girls. So I always brag that Jennifer Lopez taught me to dance. She was in many ways kind of a lighthouse to me because being a kid from the Bronx I didn't come from a showbiz family I didn't know anybody who had a career in this business but knowing her and watching her I used to like finish my homework on Sunday nights so that I could see her being a fly girl on In Living Color so I think in some ways there was always a little part of me that thought maybe it was possible because Jennifer did it so there you go Tandy gets credit for my college degree Jennifer gets credit for me even going for a career in acting at all. If you don't stop using that needle, 
They're gonna take away your music and put you in jail. Is that poison worth losing everything? I've had several opportunities in my career to play characters inspired by real women, but Della B in Ray Charles was, I think, the first where I got to, I drove out to Palm Springs with my boyfriend at the time, and we found her in this tiny town and spent hours and hours and hours with her, and she was incredibly generous, and she really helped me to understand the character, but Ray was an extraordinary experience. It was my first time working with Jamie, who I adore. He's my movie husband forever. I learned a lot making that movie, and it was the first time in my career, you know, Save the Last Dance was a huge commercial success, and it was a bit of a phenomenon in pop culture, but Ray was the first time that I was part of a film that was so critically lauded and it was the first time I ever went to the Globes, first time I ever watched the Oscars and knew the people that were there. <laughs> it was a very special time, a big change in for me in my career. Ray premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, so I'll never forget being part of a like a an elite festival circuit, making sure that the film lived in the world in the way that the studio wanted it to, making sure that it was considered for awards, that many of us won awards and were nominated for awards. I didn't really understand until that moment in my career why people called it a campaign, but it's work. It's work to go after those awards. And I watched Jamie do it, and then I watched it again with Last King of Scotland with Forrest Whitaker. And at that point, I thought, oh, I'm like a lucky charm. Like if you hire me to play your wife, dead or alive, you're gonna win an Oscar. So that was cool. <laughs> Here's the upside. You don't love him. No. You'll kill him. And nobody's better at that than you are. Mm. And then it'll be over. I loved working on Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I really did, I thought it was so fun. I really loved doing the stunt work. I loved working with Angelina. She is so smart. And that film went through a lot of changes while we were making the film. Doug Liman is just a brilliant filmmaker, but also like constantly inventing a new perspective, new ideas, new materials. So you have to be in a constantly evolving process. I watched Angelina navigate that so brilliantly and just always have the right perspective about what was right for the narrative of the film and also in particular for her character. It was fun to climb a mountain with her. It was fun to learn how to climb a mountain. I mean, one of the things I love about acting is that I get to learn to do so many new things all the time, like from dancing and Save the Last Dance to shoplifting and lift to joining a band to riding a horse in Django. Like I'm now in Little Fires learning to be a photographer. Like I get to grow my own skill set by having to step into the shoes of another person. If you don't do something now, I'm, go I'm going to have to find a place to go. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to get it done in one of the villages. Is that what you want, no, Nicholas? No, you don't. Come here. <laughs> Whatever you do, you don't do that. Right? That was one of the first projects I didn't audition for. Forrest and I actually decided to work with the same accent coach so that we were approaching the accent from the same perspective, the same tactics. And then when I got to Uganda, I basically only spoke in the accent all the time. And my goal was to just try to have it be invisible to the people around me. And I spent a lot of time hanging out with the women there, just like trying to absorb as much of the sound and the music and the culture and the demeanor as possible. A lot of people in Uganda at the time when we shot that film had visceral memories from their childhood of Idi Amin. So we would be driving to work one day and I would say, well, why doesn't anybody take that road? And my, I remember my driver saying, well, that was the road where Idi Amin's army used to kill people. And like, it was just matter of fact. It was profound to be in a place where also you felt like you were allowing people to tell their own story, to have their history be seen for the world. And Forrest, of course, is so brilliant in the film. When we got there, he started to transition and transform, and I did not see my friend Forrest again until we wrapped the movie. There was this other sort of darker, more depressed and enigmatic version of a man that was not the man I know. I 
love working with James McAvoy. I think he is incredibly talented. And I remember one day, actually, he was working so hard on that movie because he really, you know, carried that movie beginning to end. The journey of his character was the arc of the film, as brilliant as Forrest was and as he's deserving of every accolade. James was our way into that world. He was working so hard and I remember a few of the actors and I, we kidnapped James to take him on a one-day safari while we were there because he wasn't taking advantage of this, you know, magical experience that we were having living in Africa and he had a blast. I have immense respect for him and admiration for his talent and his work ethic and I think he can do anything and I'm dying to work with him again. If you're listening, James McAvoy, maybe you could win an Oscar if you hire me to play your wife. I have to be your wife. Es ist meine und unseres gemeinsamen Freundes Absicht, sie für immer von hier wegzuholen. Wo ist er? I loved the experience of making Django and it almost broke me. <laughs> It was, I mean, I used to say it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but I actually don't think that's true anymore. But for a long time, it was the scariest and hardest thing I had ever had to do as an actor to step into the legacy of slavery and be willing to stand in those places where slaves, I mean, we shot on actual plantations to make myself that psychologically and emotionally and physically vulnerable was a huge challenge and cost me a lot for a while in terms of my spirit. But it also gave me the ability to feel like there was nothing I couldn't handle. Not just as an actor, quite honestly, but in life. I don't know if I could have walked through seven seasons of Scandal without doing Django. It really made me feel like I could do anything. I have to credit my co-stars to a lot of that. Jamie and Leo and Christoph, they kind of surrounded me and took care of me. They were immensely supportive and also just a lot of fun. I will be forever indebted to Quentin Tarantino for trusting me with that role. She is the siren in that film. She is what he is questing for. Quentin really trusted me to be worthy of the journey that Django takes in the film and trusted me to dance, so to speak, alongside Kristoff because most of our scenes were together and Kristoff was massively supportive with the German and, and just in general. So it was, it was a really special project. It was hard for all of us, forced us to find new levels of strength, but we were all better for it. And I think audiences can feel that commitment. I mean, you look at Jamie's performance or Leo's performance and you just know that that everybody's heart was right out there on the table. I am never going to be over you. Your wife is at Blair House and she's about to explode your political career. You'll never get reelected if you don't get her back. Your time as president will be over and you're worried about getting your mistress back. How many times do I need to tell you that you're more than that? If you want me, earn me. Until then, we are done. Scandal did not come to me. <laughs> Scandal was, you know, as, as has been talked about a lot, there had not been a black woman as the lead of a network drama in almost 40 years. Every black actress in Hollywood wanted to be Olivia Pope. And when I read it, I loved the script so much and I felt like it was mine. But unfortunately, I knew about 10 other girls that felt the same way. It was a pretty extensive audition process. I think I first met with Shonda and Betsy, her producing partner. And I remember actually Shonda saying, you know, are you up for television? Because you have this really great film career. And if this is a hit, we could be like, for all intents and purposes, married for seven years. In my head, I was like, that's not happening. What are the odds of that? <laughs> I loved Shonda and I loved the script and I loved the world of the show. I loved Judy Smith, who was the inspiration for Olivia Pope, who was then called Olivia Price in the original draft. I fought for it. I remember I bought a suit for my audition. I did not have the income to go out and buy myself a suit, but I did. I think at Lowman's in New York. As an athlete would say, I left it all out on the field in my audition. I knew I did, but I still didn't know if it was mine. And then when it was, I felt really, really blessed. And I never, ever thought that it would be 
the cultural phenomenon that it became, never in my wildest dreams. I knew that I had never been number one on the call sheet before, and so that this was the opportunity of a lifetime. And I had worked with some of the best number ones in the business, from Forrest to Jamie to Meg Ryan and Julia Stiles. I mean, really great, incredible, inspiring number ones, and I wanted to be that kind of number one. But I also knew that if I didn't give it my all and do the best work I was capable of, they weren't gonna put another black woman in the number one role on a TV drama for another 40 years. I really felt like it was my job to do my best work. And I didn't know if the world was ready for it because everybody was telling us that it was a risk to put a black woman as a lead of a network drama. I didn't know if anybody would tune in to watch, but I knew it didn't matter. Even if the only four eyeballs watching were my parents, we had to make the best possible show for my parents so that if the world wasn't ready, at least we were proud of what we made. Luckily, the world was ready for not just Olivia Pope, but also Annalise Keating and Priyanka Chopra and tons and tons of women of color on every network since. It's mama again, baby. He's been gone since eight o'clock last night. There was an incident. Where's our son? I have kids too. Any of them black? The world still looks at him like it looks at me. I don't know what you expect me to do. Find my son! So when Scandal was ending, there was a brilliant, prolific Broadway producer named Jeffrey Richards who I had worked with almost 10 years before on my Broadway debut called Race, which was right before Scandal. It was a play with David Mamet. And so Jeffrey Richards called me and said, Scandal's ending, you should come back to Broadway. And I hadn't had a chance to do Broadway since Scandal started. We didn't, our hiatuses weren't long enough. I thought, no way. Like, the only thing I want to do when Scandal ends is take a nap. Like, I... I don't want to go do the hardest version of acting there is. That's just ridiculous. But yes, send me whatever you want, Jeffrey. Send me whatever you want. One of the things that he sent me was American Son. And I knew that Kenny Leon was attached to direct. And I adore Kenny. And I trust him as a theater director. And I read the script and, and was blown away and could not imagine not doing it. I jumped onto the project as an actor and as a producer. And we brought the production to Broadway. And before before previews even began for the play, I was already in talks with various platforms and, and networks and studios about possibly transforming the play for the screen. And we have been lucky enough to partner with Netflix, who really understood from the very beginning the importance of the production and its value globally, that these are issues that resonate all over the world and a story that deserves to be told all over the world. We're really excited to be taking this really special play that had a tremendous impact on audiences in New York, but could only you know, be performed to 900 people at a time, to now bringing that narrative, that story, this journey of this family to millions and millions of people all over the world. One of the things that Kendra taught me as an actor was how to draw the line between myself and the character because there was no way that I could be Kendra 24 hours a day. And I always take my characters home with me a little bit, but playing Kendra required me to leave her at the theater. And so I actually would get to the theater earlier than most actors. I had actually had a great conversation with Alec Baldwin. He's the same way. He likes to get to the theater like two or three hours before the performance because he doesn't want to be thinking about the play in the rest of his life, but he wants to give himself the right amount of time to transition into the character. She belonged at the theater, and I spent a lot of time at the theater, and when I was at the theater, she got all of me, but when I was not at that theater, I had to be in the joy of the rest of my life. Our storytelling canons have, for hundreds of years, taught us that heroes look one way, right? That most heroes happen to have been straight and white and male, so, just by being a woman and being a person of color, when I stand in the center of a story and I say like, this is about me and my journey, that is somewhat of a political act. I guess I'm proud to have been able to do projects that have allowed me to build full humanity around the characters. Even if I'm in a supporting role on Save the Last Dance, I knew that it was my job so that you don't think of black teen moms in Chicago as statistics anymore, but you think of them as people. 
And I guess for the future, I just want to keep doing that for myself and for other actors and other writers and other producers and directors to be able to tell stories where we put people at the center who may not obviously be at the center and that we remind everybody that heroes come in all shapes and sizes and colors and genders and that we're all heroes of our own moment. That's what I just want to keep doing is creating opportunities for that.